You know, I once heard a, a series of lessons that dealt with the different names by which um, God is referred to. And the main point uh, was that each of God's name in the Bible, each of God's names uh, rather in the Bible referred to a specific aspect of His character. For example, in Isaiah 12 verse 6, He is referred to as the Holy One, which refers to the purity of His character, the purity of His being. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, uh, He is referred to as eternal God. Uh, the essence of His person. He is without beginning or end, the eternal God. So there are many of these titles, names, if you wish, for God that describe, um, that describe Him. Now, if you were to continue with that line of study and thinking into the New Testament, you would see that not only God the Father has various names, but God the Son also has different names and titles that make reference to his character. For example, uh, in Matthew 9, he's referred to as the Lord of harvests. The Lord of harvests. In Matthew 12, verse 8, Lord of the Sabbath. So in the New Testament, he is referred to as the Lord of many, many things. Well, in my lesson tonight, I want to preach on a passage of scripture which reveals one of the most comforting aspects of Jesus' character a vision of Him that demonstrates that He is not only the Lord of the harvest, not only the Lord of the Sabbath, but also He is the Lord of hopeless situations. I want to read Mark, if you're already there, beginning in verse 21, that's the passage that we'll base this lesson on. Let's read together, please. It says, when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death, please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And so this miracle takes place as Jesus is on His way to heal a young girl uh, upon the request of her father, who was a synagogue official, probably an elder in the synagogue. There was a crowd following Jesus, as always. You ever notice there's always a crowd following Him. He's always in the middle of a crowd. And we will read that in this crowd there is a woman who approaches him. So let's read on in that verse. It says, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Let's stop there for a second. Talk about hopeless. Talk about hopeless. She has an issue of blood, a hemorrhage of some kind, a discharge of some kind. And the result of this is that she is suffering from physical pain and discomfort, not for a month or a six months, 12 years. Think about that. Imagine 12 years, 12 long years suffering from this particular ailment. And it says that she also suffered in treatment. Uh, uh, you know, we think that medicine is painful today. Can you imagine how primitive it was in those days? The things that uh, doctors, uh, physicians tried to do to heal people in that time. And also there was the deterioration of her condition, not only her physical strength and health, but also of her finances. She was ruined. She spent everything that she had in trying to uh, get well. But she also suffered something else which is not written here, it's kind of in between the lines. She suffered also social rejection because she was Levitically unclean. Now the Old Testament law forbade anyone with recurrent bleeding or discharge to be included in the normal contact with other people and this also included worship. An indirect reason may have been a form of you know, health protection for a generation who had no protection against communicable diseases, but 
The main reason was that these things, especially involving blood, suggested death. And contact with the dead made a person in the Jewish faith ceremoniously or Levitically unclean. The idea was simple. Uh, disease equals death, death equals sin, and sin could not coexist with holiness and purity, and to mix the two was not permitted. So those who were unclean had to follow certain regulations in order to purify themselves and demonstrate that they were ready to rejoin normal interaction with their community. So this clean and unclean distinction you know, it was a necessary way to teach them that there existed an acceptable as well as an unacceptable status and that God who was holy required a holy people. Now the details of this law that dealt with her condition was contained in Leviticus in chapter 15. And let's go to that. I think it's worth reading this passage because it'll bring home to us exactly what this woman was going through and exactly what she had to do from day to day to deal with the illness that she suffered. So Leviticus chapter 15, beginning in verse 25. It says, now, if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity. She is unclean. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her like her bed at menstruation. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean like her uncleanness at that time. Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. When she becomes clean from her discharge, she shall count off for herself seven days, and afterwards she will be clean. Then on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other one for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on her behalf before the Lord because of her impure discharge. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling. My tabernacle that is among them. This is the law for the one with a discharge and for the man who has a seminal emission so that he is unclean by it. And for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity and for the one who has a discharge, whether male or female, or a man who lies with an unclean woman and so on and so forth. Can you imagine? Did you see all of the things there that, that this woman was suffering? the things that she had to clean and remain clean, nobody could touch her, nobody could touch anything that she touched, nobody could sit where she sat. She was considered as an individual that you could not come in contact with, she could not go, she couldn't go to worship. She couldn't be, you know, so, uh, she couldn't interact socially with her, with her people. Now, Usually, illness draws sympathy and support from others. And that helps us get through, right? We get a car to visit, how you doing? I'm praying for you, you know? But in her case, her illness caused quite the opposite. Her illness separated her from her health, her well-being. Eventually, it separated her from her wealth. It separated her from her people and ultimately the comfort and the reassurance that she needed in the worship of her God. So this woman truly was caught in a hopeless situation. But, but, her hopeless situation changed. And here's why. Let's go back to Mark and continue reading in Mark, shall we? Verse 27. Remember I said before she, um, uh, she had seen many physicians, she had spent all that she had, she was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. And then in verse 27 it says, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, 
I will get well. You see her situation beginning to change here? Her situation changed first of all because, well, she came to Jesus. She came from behind because of her uncleanness. She wasn't allowed contact for fear of making the other person impure. She came secretly because of her shame. She was unacceptable. Something must be wrong with her because she was still sick. She was still sick, 12 years. She began to think to herself, you know, something's wrong with me. God is not helping me. So she came with nothing left to offer, but she came to the right person. She had nothing to give, nothing to exchange, nothing to offer, but she came to the right person. You see, your faith is worthless if it's not directed towards the proper objective. This woman learned an important lesson, and the lesson is this. Who you believe, who you believe in, determines the power of your religion. It's not just a kind of a general, all-purpose faith in some sort of good God up there that takes care of it. You know, when I hear people say, you know, the big guy upstairs. <laughs> I'm talking to the big man upstairs, you know, that general, you know, kind of woolly, fuzzy kind of God, you know? It's not this general, all-purpose faith in a good God that saves us. This is the biggest lie in religion. Only faith specifically focused on Jesus saves. Christianity is very clear and very adamant on this point. Christianity is an exclusive religion. It's not an inclusive religion. It includes everyone, of course, but that everyone has to be coming to Jesus. It's very exclusive about that. I'll tell you one better. Better a weak and anxious faith in Jesus Christ, you know, like that worried father who cried out, I do believe, but help my disbelief you know, for his son. Better that kind of faith, better this type of trembling faith than a zealous devotion to a person or a thing that has no power to save us. False prophets and religions, no matter how big these religions are, no matter how old these, some people say our religion is thousands of years old, so what? We've had these customs for hundreds of years, so what? We've got this building here, it's inlaid with gold and you know, pilgrims come to this building you know, by the millions, you know, so what? Human philosophies that exclude God from their order and from their explanation of existence could be very fancy and difficult to understand, but so what? These things, you know, they have appeal and they give some sort of meaning to life, but they can't save. This woman came to Jesus with a secret and fearful faith, but the help that she needed came nevertheless because it was Jesus who was the object of her faith, and the Lord of hopeless situations did not disappoint her. You know, a lot of people have fallen because the object of their faith is a, a religious leader, or a movement, or a certain doctrinal position, or the size and the strength of the church that they go to. And their faith goes up and down as the size of their congregation or as the popularity of their leader goes up and down. They go up and down with them. But what God is asking us to do is to believe in His Son, that our faith be directed toward Him and only Him. And Jesus, who never changes, who never abandons, who always loves us. You ever think about that? Jesus always loves us. I'll ask you something. Do you always love yourself? Do you always love yourself? I don't know about you, but I've caught myself saying, you dummy, what did you say that for? 
Or why didn't you do this? You had an opportunity. Have you never, have never had that experience? Something comes up and you know you ought to be doing this good thing, this helpful thing, this Christian thing, you know, but your flesh says, no, I don't feel like it. <laughs> and you don't do it. And then after you're thinking, oh, sheesh. Do you ever realize that God, that Jesus keeps loving you through those moments? He loves you even when you don't love you. And that's the kind of Lord that I want. Jesus who never changes, who never abandons, who always love us, will positively save us from every hopeless situation as He did for this woman in this encounter. So her situation changed, her hopeless situation changed Number one, because she came to the right person. She came to Jesus. Secondly, another reason why her situation changed, she came to Jesus with faith. She not only came to the right person, she also came in the proper manner. She approached with faith. Of course, we have described her faith in terms of obedience, uh, we describe faith in terms of perseverance and action, but this doesn't adequately describe exactly what happens in a person's heart when they believe. Obedience, perseverance, these things don't tell us what this woman was thinking. You see, before there is obedience and perseverance and so on and so forth, there needs to come a trusting act of the heart that unburdens itself from the responsibility of accomplishment and that transfers this responsibility for accomplishment over to Jesus Christ. She came to Jesus and she gave to Him the responsibility for accomplishing her healing. In describing her, you know, Mark says, she tried this, she did that, she spent her money you know, on the physicians and she, she did all of that. Coming to Jesus, she had nothing left to give except her situation. Once this is done, it is a joy to obey. The yoke, you know, the yoke that is easy. You ever wonder why the yoke is easy? The yoke is easy because we've transferred over to Jesus the responsibility for pulling the load. That's why the yoke is easy. The yoke is hard when we're, you know, we're always trying to be just an inch in front of Jesus and it's so hard. You know, we're pushing hard you know, and He's just an inch behind us saying, go ahead, knock yourself out, Bubba. How's that working for you? And then all of a sudden, you know, we decide to transfer over to him the responsibility for pushing. We just back up a little and go, wow, this is pretty good. All I got is the yoke. He's carrying the load. We have a hard time in our spiritual lives because we do not abandon, and I mean abandon, the responsibility for accomplishing our own salvation. We don't abandon that or we don't abandon the responsibility for affecting our own reconciliation, or we don't abandon the responsibility for producing our own sanctification. We think we're going to do these things through willpower, and we can't. Faith, initially, is accepting the fact that Jesus Christ has become all of these things for us. I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Listen to what Paul says. He says, but by His doing, meaning Jesus, but by His doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We want salvation, we want reconciliation with God, we want sanctification, in other words, we want growth, spiritual development, we want that, but Jesus does that in us. We don't, we don't do it. So faith, initially, 
is accepting the fact that Christ has become these things for us. You see, when Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, Satan accuses you to God night and day, Satan accuses you to yourself night and day, that's that voice in there telling you you're no good, you're not going to make it, how, how dare you, blah, blah, blah. That's not Jesus' voice, that's Satan's voice. When Satan stands before the throne of God, accusing me, Mike Mazzalongo, as he does all of you, and says, tell us, what do you know? Do you know all the doctrines and what they mean? I will answer that all I know is Jesus Christ. That's the thing I'm sure of. And he will say, explain to us why you deserve to enter into heaven. What have you accomplished exactly? And I will confess that Christ is the only reason that I am here, period. And Satan will challenge me by saying, show us your sinless life. And I will point to Jesus' life as my own life, where every one of his victories cancels out every one of my failures. And finally, in a bid to destroy my hope, Satan will say, give us what you owe God now. And I will offer only the cross of Jesus Christ as final payment for all of my wicked deeds. And God will accept this from me because He offered me His Son for this very purpose of serving as my wisdom. No longer my wisdom that I have before God, it's His wisdom that I have before God. And my righteousness, no longer my righteousness counts for anything, it's the righteousness that He has given me that I offer to God. No longer my sanctification or my redemption because I have none of these things and I can accomplish none of these things on my own. You see, I also was in a hopeless situation when I first met Jesus, as were we all. The only difference is some of, it, some of us were more aware of it than others. The offer of Christ to serve in this way is what grace is all about, and accepting Him doing all of this for you is what saving faith is all about. If you don't accept Jesus in this way, no amount of water will ever wash away your guilt and no number of good deeds or busy work will ever make you right before God. But if we give over the responsibility to Christ to accomplish these things for us, our repentance will become a joyful experience and our baptism will truly become a burial of the hopelessly lost sinner and the resurrection of the saved and living saint. This is why the woman was healed. She gave over to Jesus the responsibility to heal her, and He did. Now we said that this woman was healed because she brought her hopeless situation to the right person, Jesus, and she came to Jesus in the right attitude, with faith. Now let's explain how the situation was actually changed. We know why. Let's look at the, let's look at the how. Let's read verse 29, shall we? Chapter 5, verse 29. It says, um, verse 29, yes, it says, um, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. Let's just stop right there. It says immediately, the bleeding stopped. The sign of the affliction that she had it still stopped. It means she was still suffering and in the throes of it, even while she was coming to Jesus. And let's read 29b. Then it says immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. She knew she was well again. She felt like her old self again. You know, there's this old joke about uh, middle age. You know, uh, the old joke about middle age, it says, you know you've reached middle age because you keep telling yourself that just in a couple of days you're going to feel like your old self again, and you never do. 
Well, this woman, this woman felt like her old self again. The scourge, that's the literal translation, you know this word affliction? <laughs> the literal translation into English is the scourge. The scourge that she had suffered under was gone and she knew it, she knew it. It's like you have a migraine headache and then it's gone. You know you don't have that headache anymore. This resolved the physical and the financial drain on her because of this illness. Let's read verse 30, shall we? It says, immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. In these verses we see that Jesus heals her socially as well as physically. By making her disease and healing a public thing, she now would be accepted as clean among her peers and received back into her community and the worship of the temple. If she had just touched them, been healed and snuck away, who knows? Who would know? Only her, only Jesus. Physically she'd be okay, but socially she'd still be an outcast. Jesus knew who touched him, he knew why, he knew what took place, but it was important that she and the people know also for her benefit and the building up of her faith. Jesus sends her away healed physically, healed emotionally, healed spiritually. She can leave with joy and peace because she knows that it wasn't a coincidence, it wasn't magic that stopped the flow, it was her faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of hopeless situations, that made her well. How many times, how many times do we pray and ask God for help and so on and so forth, and then when that help comes and when that problem is solved, what do we do? We say, man, a, I'm having a lucky week. Really? How many times do we forget to say, God, you did this thing, thank you. I've said this so many times, you know, like my wife, she prays for parking spots and I go, stop, stop bothering the Lord for parking spots, but you know. And then she laughs when she gets a parking spot, you know, uh, 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 handicapped parking, handicapped parking, whoops, empty spot. You know, this story tells us a great deal about this woman and her faith in the Lord, but it also reveals something about the nature of Jesus as the Lord of hopeless situations. First of all, we are never too damaged or too far gone to come to Him in faith so that He can heal us. For this woman, Jesus was the last resort, the end of the line. How many times do we, do we allow ourselves to get to a point where Jesus is the last person we ask for help rather than the first person we ask for help? Another thing we learn is that Jesus is always aware of our suffering. He never forgets us. He never forgets our situation. Even in a crowd, He knew this woman. He knew her needs. No matter how lonely, Jesus is aware of us and aware of our needs. And we find out also that when Jesus heals, He heals the whole person, not just the symptoms. This woman left without physical suffering and she was also at peace with God, with her society, with her fellow believers, and with herself. And so the question begs to be asked at the end of this lesson, what is the hopeless situation in your life? Is it a cycle of fear, loneliness, depression? Is it, is it the fear of loneliness coming? <laughs> the fear of growing older and more frail? 
What is our hopeless situation? An unhappy or trus troublesome relationship? A burden of guilt that continues to gnaw at us? Rebellious children, rebellious grandchildren? Shattered dreams, bad habits, burnout? Whatever it is, this, listen, this lesson tells you that you need to stop trying to fix things all by yourself. And for us here in this congregation, this really, I'm getting personal now, because it's just us, right? We need to stop faking it. We need to stop faking it by telling everybody else that everything is okay when it's not. We have the potential here of having anywhere up to 400 people praying for us. How many times has it happened, and I'm talking more maybe to some of our elders here and other ministers, how many times has it happened that you find out way after the fact that brother or sister so-and-so has been struggling with cancer or a bad marriage or, oh yeah, oh, I didn't tell you, yeah, my husband, yeah, he left four months ago. What? And every Sunday you walk through that door and I said, how you doing? And you said, ah, oh, good, fine. You lied to me. You lied to me. And when we do that, you know what we're doing, right? We're trying to take care of it by ourselves. We don't want anybody to come in and help us. We don't want people to know our weakness. We don't want people to know that for 12 years we've had an issue of blood, whatever issue of blood means for you in your life. The woman in the story ultimately had to bring her problem to Christ. And when she did, it was the beginning of hope. She didn't just think about Jesus or say, well, maybe the next time he was near her house, she might come on out and visit with him. She didn't say that. Yeah, nah, next time, tomorrow. He, I'm sure he's going to do another speech by the, you know, by the sea tomorrow. She came through the crowd and actually touched him. And this decision and action that came from it, this was the beginning of her hope. You see, there is hope in the idea that a problem is about to end, even if it hasn't completely disappeared. It is a hopeful thing to see the tide beginning to turn in our favor. When I bring the broken things in my life to Jesus Christ, even though nothing may immediately change on the surface, I know that the beginning of a complete healing process is underway and that ignites my hope. I know this is true because I believe that Jesus is not only the Lord of hopeless situations, He is the Lord of hope itself. Do you need hope? Is that what's missing maybe? Is there some sort of hopeless situation that you face? Why not bring it to Jesus Christ tonight? Even if you come with a trembling and tentative heart, bring it to Him nevertheless, because the Lord of hopeless situations will never disappoint those who come to Him in faith. Whatever it is, there is hope in Christ for you tonight. Please, please believe in the Lord Jesus and come now if you need His help.